again we'll have you please stand as the acting Lord Mayor and the official party of the Chamber. Thanks very much. Thank you. Please take a seat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Smith. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the City of Adelaide. And a very warm welcome to the Council Chamber for the annual Colonel Light Ceremony. Uh, it's my great pleasure to invite the Acting Board Mayor, Dr. Michael Warren Smith, AM, to give the address this morning. Thank you, Acting Board Mayor. Councillors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today we gather on the traditional land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains to celebrate the 227th birthday of Colonel William Light, the founder of the City of Adelaide. The Adelaide City Council pays respect to elders past and present of the Ghana people who nurtured this part of the continent for more than 50,000 years. We acknowledge their cultural heritage, customs, beliefs and traditions and their relationship with the land which is of continuing importance today. I realise and appreciate the great honour and distinction it is for me to deliver the Colonel Light Address in this place at this time. As the City Planner for eight years and the Town Clerk for 12 years, I had the privilege of attending the annual Colonel Light Ceremonies and heard Lord Mayor's Campbell, Roach, Joseph, Bowen, Watson, Chapman, Jarvis and Condus give the address. Each Lord Mayor sought something new to say about Colonel Light and looked at his achievements through a different lens. One even managed to find a quote from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was. <laughs> William Light was the son of Francis Light, the founder of Penang, and Martina Rosales. He was born in Kuala Kedar on 27th of April, 1786. At the age of six, he was sent to England to be brought up by the Georgie family in the village of Theberton in Suffolk. He was well educated, entered the Navy and left with the rank of midshipman. Little is known of his movements for the next few years, but in 1808, he bought a commission in the 4th Dragoon Cavalry. He saw action in Portugal and Spain and had a distinguished military career in the Peninsular War, serving with the Duke of Wellington. In 1821, Light married a Miss Perrault of Londonderry. It's not known what happened to his first wife, but in 1824, at the age of 38, he married Miss Mary Bennett, who was only 20. She was the daughter of the Duke of Richmond and had a small inheritance. This enabled them to travel extensively in Europe and around the Mediterranean, including a long trip on the Nile. During this time, he made many sketches and paintings. In 1832, Light returned to England, but Mary stayed in Egypt and started living with a Mr. Hugh Bowen. The Lights never got divorced. In September 1834, Light sailed from London and commanded the Nile, a paddle steamer with sails that had been built for the Egyptian Navy. One of the passengers was Captain John Hindmarsh of the Royal Navy. In that year, the bill for the South Australian Colonisation Act was drafted by Edward Gibbon Wakefield and his brother. It was introduced into the House of Commons by William Whitmore MP and supported in the House of Lords by the Duke of Wellington. The foundation of the province was primarily based on the systematic colonisation of Wakefield, that land should be sold at sufficient price to make the new colony self-supporting. The irony was that the germ of the high-minded principles of South Australia's foundation came from the brain of a convict in Newgate Prison in London. Wakefield had been jailed for three years for abducting a schoolgirl in Paris and spent his time in jail reading everything he could about Australia. The Act provided for a board of commissioners to be appointed, and Colonel Torrens, an Anglo-Irish MP, was the chair, with Angus, Bernard, Hill, Hutt, Lefebvre, McKinnon, Mills, Montefiore, Palmer and Wright, all well-known street and place names as the commissioners. The Act also specified that £20,000 surety had to be created 
with £35,000 raised from the sale of land, at a minimum of 12 shillings an acre, before any settlement could occur. This was achieved mainly through George Fife Angus, who was the most prominent of the businessmen and bankers on the board. Angus was one of a number of Christian nonconformists who were a curious mixture of radicalism and conservatism, which set the very nature of South Australia and made it different from the other states. It was the only colony not to have had a penal settlement, and free settlement in South Australia was an important aspect of this sense of difference. On one hand, there was an advocacy of religious freedom and a willingness to experiment, while on the other, there was a strong sense of the critical role of property and the need for respectability and propriety. Angus had urged Methodists, Congregationists, Baptists, and other nonconformists and dissenters from the Church of England to emigrate to Adelaide, which was described by Douglas Pike in his book as the Paradise of Dissent. Captain Highmarsh returned to England from Egypt, and he lobbied successfully for the post of governor of the new colony. Hugh Stratton has argued that Light's background with the Duke of Wellington was very important in relation to the city of Adelaide, and I quote, an important aspect of the history of South Australia and relations between the city and the state was the influence of individuals. This went back to the earliest days of the colony. William Light had been on the staff of the Duke of Wellington in the Peninsula War and acted as a scout. With great bravery, he would ride close to the lines of the French enemy, obtain information about their strength and precise location, and return to the English lines in safety, where he would provide the Duke with an accurate map. Many years later, when the Duke had become the Prime Minister, and a bill to establish the province of South Australia had been passed, he recalled his junior officer, William Light, who was now a colonel, and recommended that he be the Surveyor General because of his mapping abilities. Thus, Colonel William Light became the Surveyor General with a salary of £400 a year. His specific instructions from the commissioners were to examine 1,500 miles of coastline, select the best situation for the first settlement, survey the town site, and divide the country into sections. An important additional instruction was that he had to look to any new town precedent in America and Canada. When Light sailed from England on the 1st of May 1836 in the rapid, he already had tuberculosis and was still suffering from a wound he had received at Corona. He arrived at Kangaroo Island on the 20th of August 1836. He was not impressed with the island because it had no surface water and little arable land, and he quickly relocated to Rapid Bay on the mainland and started to explore the eastern coast of Gulf St. Vincent. Settlers started arriving and camped at Hold Fast Bay before Light had determined the site for the new city. On the 22nd of November 1836, Light wrote to the commissioners enclosing a rough plan which showed two simple rectangles, one north and one south of the yet to be named River Torrens. In a very important comment, Light proposed that an area of land around the town be reserved as park grounds. Light also wrote that although his duty obliged him to look to other sites, he was convinced that the eastern coast of Gulf St. Vincent was the most eligible and that the harbour would be safe. Governor Heinrich arrived at Holfast Bay on the Buffalo and he proclaimed the new colony of South Australia on the 28th of December 1836. Britain had intended settlement in South Australia to be consensual, requiring a treaty with the Aboriginals, but this was ignored by Heinrich. Light declined to attend the proclamation ceremony as he was evaluating the empty plan as the site for the city. Light was pleased with the supply of fresh water and the general appearance of the country between the hills and the sea. His decision for the site of the city was made on the 29th of December 1836. On the following day, Governor Heinmarsh accompanied Light to the site which Light had selected. Heinmarsh immediately criticised it as being too far from the harbour, as new cities were usually sighted by the water. But Light stuck to his decision, relying on his instructions from the commissioners, that while he had to pay respect to the governor's opinion, his own judgment was to be paramount.
in the selection of the site for the city. Wright moved from Highmark from Belfast Bay a few days later to start surveying the 1,001 acre blocks as required by the commissioners. Toiling under a fierce sun, he used wheelbarrows and handcarts to move his equipment. However, Hindmarsh ordered a public meeting on the 10th of February 1837 to debate the issue of Light's preferred site of the city, as Hindmarsh was still unhappy with Light's choice. At the meeting, a number of motions and amendments were put, and Light recorded them in detail in his diary. In summary, Light's site received 218 votes, and Hindmarsh's proposed alternative site at the harbour, only 137 votes, a clear majority of 81. Thus, Light continued with his survey and completed it on the 10th of March 1837, an amazing feat of painting a city on a spacious canvas in two months. There was much controversy about the origins of Light's plan for the city of Adelaide, with its figure eight belts of continuous parklands and six public squares. He may have been influenced by the traditional Greek patterns of Roman camps, or go to man's plan for Toronto. Catania's ideal plan for a new city in 1554, featuring a central square and surrounding smaller squares, was a possible precedent for the layouts of Charleston, 1672, Philadelphia, 1683, and Savannah, 1773, in North America. There is a possibility that Light may have travelled to America and visited Philadelphia, as he could have been familiar with William Light's plan as there is some similarity between South Adelaide with Philadelphia in terms of the rectangular grid, five squares, the width of streets, and containment of the city. Light was familiar with the spatial consequences of colonial new towns and the need for concentration and enclosure as a means of controlling the supply and value of land. Before he left for South Australia, would also, Light would also have been aware of the layout of London squares which were recognised as a suitable location for town residences. The squares form five geometrical figures in the town plan and were London's contribution to city design in the 18th century. Many attempts have been made to trace the sources of Light's inspiration for his plan for Adelaide. But in my view, there is little point in speculating on the actual origins of the plan, as Light suffered a terrible blow on 22nd of January 1839 when his mud and reed hut was burnt down and he lost a lot of his possessions. However, some of the artifacts and paintings did survive and are exhibited in the Colonel Lighter here in the town hall, while others are in the State Library and the Art Gallery of South Australia. Mary Thomas, one of the original settlers, wrote in her diary in 1837 that it was Colonel Light who had chosen and laid out the site for Adelaide. <coughs> However, Johnson and Langmead argue that there is no actual evidence that Light was responsible, and they suggested it was really the work of George Kingston, Light's deputy. They based this view on letters Kingston wrote in 1877, some 30 years after the event, wherein he claimed to have informed Light that he had identified an appropriate site and recommended it to Light, and thus the credit for citing Adelaide should have gone to Kingston. Whatever role Kingston may have played, the ultimate responsibility for the site was that of the Surveyor General, Colonel William Light. Indeed, Kingston wrote in a letter to the Advertiser in 1887, and I quote, I deny the right of the government to interfere with or make use of any portion of the parklands, not specifically reserved or set apart for government purposes by Colonel Light, and so described on his original plan for the city. I think I might be excused for claiming to speak as an authority on this subject because of my official position next to Colonel Light on the survey staff, which gave me the best opportunity of knowing every detail of his plans. The original requirement was to light for Light to provide 1,000 town acres, but he actually provided 1,042. There were 700 town acres in the almost rectangular South Adelaide, and 342 town acres in the three components making up North Adelaide. 38 town acres had been used to create the six squares, and four had been reserved for government buildings, so that 42 were added to the original 1,000 for sale. In London, 437 town acres had been sold at the cost of 12 shillings an acre in accordance with the Act. And on the 22nd of March, 
the remaining lots began to be sold. Indeed, Light Ward 13 himself and High Marsh Ward 19. Whatever may have been Light's inspiration, his genius was to mould the original concept of two rectangles to the topography so that North Adelaide and East Terrace in South Adelaide follow the contours. The only buildings which Light indicated in the parklands on the plan were Government House and the military barracks off North Terrace, a hospital off East Terrace, a market off West Terrace, and a military school and Aboriginal mission school off Strangways Terrace in North Adelaide. A location for a ceremony was also, cemetery was also shown off West Terrace, and Light showed great foresight in providing for the burial of the early colonists. It is a tribute to Light that his plan for Adelaide survives almost intact and continues to determine the character of the city. Adelaide is one of the very few cities in the world whose boundaries have not been changed since their foundation. Peter Garrett, the then Commonwealth Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts, commented he had the privilege of adding the Adelaide Parklands and the city layout to the Natural Heritage List as one of Australia's greatest examples of planning heritage. For all time, the city will remain in Parklands as a geographic centre of the metropolitan area, with all the advantages of accessibility that entails. Robert Freestand contends, Adelaide is the most memorable expression of the grand model of the colonial planning tradition, distinguished by encircling parklands and internal public squares. The ill feeling between Light and Highmarch continued after the site for the city had been resolved. This time it was over the survey of the country sections, which Light was requested to undertake as part of his position as Surveyor General. Highmarsh, as governor of the whole colony, was concerned that other land should be surveyed in the country so that it could be sold, settled and farmed. <coughs> While Light had been able to survey the city of Adelaide on foot, he could not hope to survey the country sections outside the city without proper transport. Thus bullocks were bought from Van Diemen's land, Initially, Light surveyed 515 country sections, but by, by December 1837, he had surveyed over 9,000 acres. Then he sent his deputy Kingston back to London on the rapid to seek more staff and resources to carry out the survey of the country sections. Remarkably, by June 1838, when Kingston returned, nearly 25,000 acres had been surveyed. But Kingston played Light false. And instead of the additional resources as requested, Kingston brought with him demands from the commissions that Light abandoned his trigonometrical survey in favour of an allegedly quicker running survey. <coughs> Light and most of his surveying staff resigned immediately. He then formed the firm of Light, Finnis and Company, and the areas of Donnell, Port Adelaide and Gawla were subsequently surveyed by the firm. Light's health continued to decline and he retired with his companion Maria Gandhi to the cottage he had built for himself in Feverton, named after the village in Suffolk where he had lived as a boy. Mike began preparing his brief journal based on his diaries for publication. He commented in the preface that his motivation was to justify the correctness of his decision on the choice of the site for Adelaide because, and I quote, the various attacks have insidiously made upon nearly every step I thought fit to take. Light became very weak, and he was nursed by Maria and consoled by his friends Finnis and Woodford until he died on the 6th of October 1839. It is Light's own often quoted words which encapsulate his enduring epitaph. The reasons that led me to fix Adelaide where it is, I do not expect to be generally understood or calmly judged of at the present. My enemies, however, by disputing their validity in every particular, have done me the good service of fixing the whole of the responsibility upon me. I am perfectly willing to bear it. And I leave it to posterity, and not to them, to decide whether I am entitled to praise or blame. A copper plate with the inscription, the founder of the city of Adelaide, was placed inside Light's coffin. The funeral procession went from Light's cottage in Theberton to Trinity Church on North Terrace for the service and then to Light Square where he was buried on the 10th of October 1839. The register of the 12th of October 1839 with a black border described the funeral as follows. The procession left Theberton Cottage a little before 12 
and until its arrival at Trinity Church, minute guns were fired. All business ceased, and the flag at Government House flew at half mast. 450 gentlemen mourned at his graveside. Colonel George Gawler succeeded High Marshal as the Governor, and when Light died, Gawler immediately sanctioned the expenditure of £100 for a memorial. It was an irony that the memorial to Light above his gravesite was designed by his former Deputy Kingston, with whom he had fallen out. The Sandstone Memorial bore the following inscription, erected by the pioneers of South Australia, in memory of Colonel William Light, First Surveyor General, and by whom the site of Adelaide was fixed on the 29th of December, 1836. However, the monument crumbled away within a few years, and a new memorial in the form of a theodolite was erected in 1905, and it remains in Light Square today. The council commissioned a fine bronze statue of Light to reflect the high regard in which he was held, designed by William Bernie Ryan, and was erected in Victoria Square in 1906, but moved to its present position on Montefiore Hill, North Adelaide, in 1838. In the words of General Napier, Light was a man of extraordinary accomplishments, sailor, soldier, musician, and artist, and good in all. He was admired by men and loved by women. He had charisma and provided flair and style amongst the other founders. Light overcame adversity, and he expected that posterity would judge him aright in his choice for the site. Successive generations have certainly appreciated and greatly admired his planning of the city, and today we honour Light's memory. In 1858, Colonel Light's old friend George Palmer sent a silver bowl to the Mayor of the Penn Corporation of the City of Adelaide, on behalf of himself, Jacob Montefiore, Rex Curry, and Alexander Elder, who had all been influential figures in the settlement of the colony. Palmer also sent some of the wedding cake from the marriage of the Princess Royal to the Crown Prince of Prussia. So began the tradition of eating cake with South Australian wine, but this morning the cake will be served with other refreshments in the Queen Adelaide room after the ceremony. <coughs> the bowl on display here has the following description. Presented to the Mayor and Corporation of Adelaide, that they may write, they may thereout drink in Australian wine to the memory of Lieutenant Colonel Light, the first Surveyor General of South Australia. Palmer also gave the council the cell portrait of Light, which usually hangs in the Colonel Light room, but is brought into the council chamber for this very special occasion. In 1859, the council authorised the expenditure of funds on colonial wine, and the annual tradition of a toast to Light began. At that time, the council was meeting in the Heinley Street Hotel, and Edmund Wright was the mayor. When the Adelaide Town Hall was built in 1868, with Wright as the architect, it became the custom for the mayor, later the Lord Mayor, to deliver an address at the annual Colonel Light ceremony and conclude with a toast. I am personally proud that the council has maintained this tradition over the years. And in accordance with it, I am pleased to ask you to stand and drink in silence a toast to the memory of the founder of the City of Adelaide, Colonel William Light. Colonel William Light, founder of the City of Adelaide. Please make your way 